Morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to finish up uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We went over verses um, 9 and, uh, I think it was 9 and 10 last week, and um, we're going to finish out the chapter today. But uh, before I start, I want to um, I want to ask you, particularly you ladies, to be absolutely sure you're here next week for next week's lesson when we get into chapter 3. The beginning of chapter 3 is addressed specifically to the women. And I'm going to have a lot to say about that. Some of it is, you know, a little difficult for some ladies. But it's God's word, and if you follow his word, you will find that your life will go so, so much easier. In any case, um, like I said, I, I hope that um, you ladies in particular will be absolutely sure not to miss um, next week's lesson, okay? All right, let's get our Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to pick up in verse 11. Beloved ones, I beg you as foreign residents and refugees, abstain from fleshly cravings which wage war against the soul. Let me stop there for a minute. As foreign residents and refugees. That little word, as, <laughs> carries a lot of significance. It's a tiny little word with two letters. But it literally means in exactly this way, in exactly the same way. So he's saying, I want you to live as foreign residents and refugees. It's no coincidence that he uses this term. If you go back to chapter 1, the, uh, Peter actually begins his epistle with this kind of language, when he says, Peter, emissary of Jesus Christ to the chosen refugees of the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And we, we've talked about how that the Jews had been, because of persecution, the Jewish Christians, that is, had, had to flee out of Jerusalem and Judea in that area and had to go take refuge in other places. And they were living in foreign countries. And, you know, the mindset of a foreigner is a lot different than the mindset of a resident or a citizen. Isn't that right? It's a lot different. He says, I beg you as foreign residents and refugees. Why do you think, why do you think Peter is telling them he wants them to live as foreign, foreigners, foreign residents, and as refugees. Why does Peter, why does Peter, he's not, what he's doing here is he's not allowing them to settle down in these locations and put down roots in these locations. Why is he encouraging them to continue to live as a foreign resident and refugee? Well, why would that be? If you were a refugee from Jerusalem or the surrounding area of Judea where God's house was, Mount Zion, if you were a refugee because of some war, let's say, you know, when the Romans invaded Jerusalem and there was a war and all the, Jesus warned the Christians to get out of there uh, when they saw the armies approaching to leave the city. And the Christians did. They left. They fled out of there those who were still there, and the Jews did not, and they were slaughtered by the Romans, and the city was destroyed, but the Christians escaped. But let's take that situation. Let's suppose you're a Christian living in AD, in AD 70, and you live in Jerusalem. And or let's say you're a Jewish Christian, and you live in Jerusalem, and or maybe you just came up to Jerusalem to keep one of the festivals, like, you know, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles that we kept last last Tuesday, and you have to flee, and you have to go settle. Because of the war and the turmoil, you have to go settle in, I don't know, let's say someplace in Turkey, because that's uh, the, the Jews in Turkey, the Jewish Christians in Turkey is what Peter addressed this to. So you had to settle down there. If you put down roots, if you make that your permanent address, 
as opposed to continuing to live as a refugee and a foreigner, what does that imply about your expectations for the future? Hmm? What does it imply? Doesn't it imply you're never going back? If you put down roots, if you're a foreigner or a refugee escaping war or whatever, and you put down roots somewhere else and you settle and say, my family from now on all of our generations, we're just going to raise our kids here. And, and, you know, Turkey's a nice country. Let's just stay there. It implies that you have no plans to go home. You know, I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 11 for just a minute. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. <clears throat> this is the faith, famous faith chapter. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, you remember the Abrahamic covenant. God told Abraham, leave your, your kinfolk, leave your, you know, your extended family here. He was living in Ur, the Chaldees, which is in uh, modern Ku Kuwait. <clears throat> he said, I want you to leave all this. And I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. Now, he didn't have Google Earth. And Abraham was not able to look it up online and see, oh, this is the place God's going to take me. Hmm. Well, let me see how the, how the terrain is between here and there so I'll know how my journey is. Let's, let's find out. He didn't have a map. He didn't have Google Earth, Google Maps. He didn't have a GPS. He didn't have any of that stuff. God just said, pack up your stuff. I'm going to take you to a place that I'm going to give you as a permanent inheritance to you and to your seed. We see this in Genesis uh, several times. So what does Abraham do? By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And no doubt, Abraham expected that when he got there, God was going to give him that land as his own land, his own inheritance. That means Abraham would, be, would own the land. And that's not exactly what happened, is it? Which he would receive as an inheritance. Excuse me. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelled in the land of promise. That is, in the land that God said he was going to give, him to it, give to him as an inheritance, but he still hadn't received it as an inheritance. There's all these other people living there, right? All, you know, there's farms, there's cities, there's all this stuff that, you know, here's Abraham, he's, he's one guy, and he's got his wife, and he's got his nephew Lot with him, and he's got his servants, and his cattle and stuff, and he's going into a foreign country, and, you know, what, would you, what do you think would happen if you went into... I don't know, you traveled in your little caravan with your family into the state of Texas. And you announced that um, the state of Texas has been given to me as an inheritance by God. I now own all of the state of Texas. It's under my control. And what would happen to you? You'd be a laughing stock, right? <laughs> People would say, yeah, really. Um, how are you going to move us out of here? See? God would have had to do it. And what happens with Abraham? He goes and he dwells in the land that God showed to him that he was going to give him afterward as an inheritance. But it says, by faith he dwelled in the, promise, in the land of promise, as, notice this, as in a foreign country. The same kind of terminology that Peter's using. He dwelled as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And you know, that's three generations. See, Abraham died without ever getting the inheritance, even though he was living there. 
His son Isaac lived his life and died, and God repeated the promise to Isaac that he gave to Abraham. And Isaac died, and he didn't receive the inheritance, and his son Jacob lived most of his life in the promised land, in, t in tents as well. And he never received the inheritance. He didn't die there. He was, uh, you may recall the story of Joseph where um, Jacob, when he was a very old man, there was a famine and you know Joseph was in Egypt and all that. And so anyway, you, know, you guys know the story. Jacob ended up going down to Egypt in order to be spared from the famine. And Jacob died in Egypt. But what did Jacob say? He said he, re he requested that his bones Whenever God delivered them from Egypt and brought them back to the promised land, that his bones would be dug up and brought back and reburied in the promised land, and that's what they did. So why did, Jake, why did Abraham dwell in tents? The word tents here is tabernacles or uh, huts or booths. It means a little lean-to, a little you know, makeshift shelter. We just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles on Tuesday. And that's what it's all about. It's how that the, whole, the children of Israel, throughout their time in the wilderness, they had to dwell in these shelters, these little lean-tos that they just threw together out of the, you know, whatever scraps of wood or whatever they could find, branches, palm, palm leaves, stuff like that. They kind of, you know, wove stuff together and made themselves a little hut. And we celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles or huts. This is what Abraham lived in. He lived in that. In fact, you saw the, the little artificial um, tabernacle or hut that we had over there on the, on the wall over there um, in the sanctuary last Tuesday. He, he lived in that his whole life. Did Abraham put down roots? No. Why did he live in a tent? Why did he live in a hut? Why didn't he build himself a house? Why didn't he buy a little piece of land and live there? You know, even if he's saying, okay, well, this is temporary, but why don't I at least, you know, make myself comfortable, make my family comfortable, and all that. Because he was waiting for God to fulfill the promise. He wasn't going to try to do it on his own. It says, for he waited for the city, and that is the restored city of Jerusalem, which Isaiah talks about so much, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah also received strength, yes, living in a hut with Abraham, to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, that is from Abraham, and him as good as dead, because he was a hundred years old when Isaac was born, um, from one man were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were, notice this, strangers and pilgrims. That means foreigners on the land. That is the land that God gave or told Abraham he was going to give him as inheritance. See, what Peter's doing here in, um, in verse 11, when he says, Beloved ones, I beg you, as foreign residents and refugees, abstain from the fleshly cravings which war against the soul. Living as foreign residents and refugees, what it really means is to walk in the footsteps of Abraham. You want to know what it looks like? Look at Abraham. Read Genesis, starting around chapter 12. Read Genesis in those chapters. Actually, it goes almost to the end of the book, which describes how Abraham lived, how Isaac lived, how Jacob lived. And they had conflicts with the people around them because they had flocks and things to graze, but they didn't own the land. But they always stayed in huts, living in huts and in tents, because their eye was on what? The promise of God. That God was going to not only give them all this land as a 
permanent inheritance, but also that God was going to even build for them a city. And that's the renewed Jerusalem, which we read about in um, Isaiah and in Revelation. All right, so let's continue. He says, Beloved ones, I beg you as foreign residents and refugees. That's keeping your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the promise like Abraham did. And don't settle in in this world. Don't put your roots down in this world. Don't accumulate a lot of stuff in this world. Don't build big, fancy, expensive houses in this world. Be satisfied with living light because this is not your home. Not that the world isn't your home. Not that the planet Earth isn't your home, but that this world system with the current inhabitants, the current leadership, is not our home. We're waiting for the promise. Okay, enough about that. Abstain from fleshly cravings which wage war against the soul. Wow. Now, it's interesting how he, how he puts this. First of all, what is a soul? You know, it's not, the, it's not your ghost, okay? The word soul, as it's used throughout the Old Testament, refers to the whole person. When God breathed, you know, breathed the breath of life into the flesh of Adam as he was, after he created him, it says the man became a living soul. The word soul includes both the external and the internal. It's the whole person, okay? As opposed to a body which is not necessarily living. A soul is living. Okay, so anyway, he says that fleshly cravings wage war against your soul or your living person. This is, this is the, uh, a reference to the, the resurrection. We have, in fact, uh, previously in chapter 1, we went over how that um, Peter kept referring back to the resurrection as our hope. And he referred back to the Abrahamic promises as our hope. And how we're to keep our eyes fixed on that. And how that the, uh, we're waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ because he's the one who's going to uh, fulfill this hope for us. And so he says that fleshly cravings. What are fleshly cravings? Well, they are lust. They are an excessive appetite. They are the pursuit of wealth. Um, fleshly cravings are the pursuit of fame. They are the pursuit of status. They are all of these things that are me-centered as opposed to God-centered. Those are fleshly cravings. So I don't care what it is. If it's any of those things, and there are, I didn't even include all of them, but I mean, that's, you get the general idea. If it's any of those things, these things, these cravings that you have in you that you think you can satisfy by indulging in other things, you know, it could even be alcohol or drugs or anything like that. If you think that you have these cravings for these things, if you allow those cravings to continue, Peter says that they wage war against the soul. That is against your whole person, your whole life. And He's implying against whether you're going to have an inheritance in the resurrection. That is, are you going to actually take part in the resurrection of the just, where our bodies come up out of the grave, as he talked about in verse in chapter 1, in the resurrection at the appearing of Christ. Now, he didn't say that these things destroy your soul, did he? He said they wage war against it. But see, a war can be won or lost by either side. Isn't that right? So here's you, your life, you as a person, your whole person, your hope of the resurrection, to have an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of God. This is you. And this is your fleshly desires over here. And these, this here, wars against or goes to war against this now there's always a battle flesh the flesh the when we talk about the flesh we're talking about the physical substance of the flesh it's a metaphor for the desires and cravings of the body the the flesh 
wars against our being and our hope. So who's going to win that war? That's, see, that's the key. Are you going to allow your fleshly lust? To, are you going to feed that? If you feed it, it grows stronger. But if you suppress it, if you put it down, in fact, the Apostle Paul talks about how that if by the spirit, excuse me, by the breath, <laughs> by the holy breath of God, we mortify the deeds of the flesh. And mortify means you kill them. If we, with the power of the breath that God has, the holy breath that God has given us, if we, if instead of allowing that, our fleshly desires to wage war against us, instead, we, instead of being on the defense, we go on the offense. And we wage war against the desires and the lusts of our flesh. And we defeat them because we can defeat them. The Apostle Paul says we have the power to defeat them by that holy breath that God has given us. He says that we can kill them by means of that holy breath. If we, the problem is we don't want to go on the attack against them. We just play defense. You have to play offense. You have to make it a point that you are going to declare war on your evil desires and evil lusts. All right, let's move on to verse 12. Having your behavior, that this is why we're living like refugees, not putting down roots, not accumulating a lot of stuff. We abstain from the fleshly cravings. And then it says, having your behavior excellent among the nations, that is the Gentiles, so that in whatever ways they defame you as offenders, they should honor God in the day of examination by observing your good deeds. Now, a lot of people think that the day of examination, it's, I think some translations say day of judgment, it's not talking about when Christ returns and Christ is the judge. It's talking about when you are being accused by other people of crimes. And this was very common in the, uh, in the early church. In fact, you see it happening to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. He was charged. You know, people were bringing him before the magistrates and, and raising up a ruckus because of him and saying that he is defying, you know, Rome and all this kind of stuff. And so he was being charged with crimes that were really that were not true and he was charged of being you know a person who who creates um you know insurrection against the government and things like that he was being charged with that and so he says um uh, you're supposed he's he's telling us to have our behavior excellent in every way our behavior is to be excellent among these nations so that in whatever ways they defame you as an offender or charge you they should honor God in the day of examination. The day of examination here is when you're brought before the judgment or you're, you're brought before officials or whatever to face whatever charges are being brought, being brought against you that are false charges. He says um, that they should honor God in the day of examination by observing your good deeds. So that when, you're, when you are judged by a fair and impartial judge, it's going to become obvious that these are false charges because the fruit of your life has been evident. And you can call many witnesses to, sh you know, to show what kind of a person and what kind of a character you are. You have, you have the ability to produce eyewitness testimony to your lifestyle and who you are and what you are. So he's, he's saying that uh, it's necessary that your behavior is always excellent for this reason. Then he says, verse 13, be submissive then to every human institution. Now that's legitimate human institution, of course. It's talking about governmental authorities. But he says, for the master. That is for Jesus. Now, let me ask you this. Does the government always treat you fairly? Does the government sometimes abuse certain citizens because of certain agendas? Yes, they do. Are there government officials who their power goes to their heads and they think they're all that and they think they can kick people around because they have the gun 
on their side and a badge on their chest. Are there, are there let's just say, police officers that are like that, that's got this big fat ego, they're not there to serve and protect, as it says on the side of their squad car, but they're there to bully. You know what I'm talking about? I, no, look, I'm not talking about the majority. By far, the majority are good officers, and they seek to, and they risk their lives day after day to protect the population. But there are some bad apples, and you might have gotten pulled over by one or two of them at some point. And they're all ego. You can't say anything to them, or they're shut up, or I'm going to arrest you. I mean, you can't even try to explain something, or they're, you know, you even try to defend yourself, you know, to say, but officer, I, um, you know, I thought that blah, 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 blah. And they shove you up against the car and put you in handcuffs. You know, shut up and, you know, and uh, you know, there, this happens. I mean, there have been videos of it and so forth. So that's, that's not just, is justice being served there when they take their power to an extreme and they begin to abuse and persecute people? No, that's not justice. But look what he says here. He says, be submissive then to every human institution for the master. That is for Christ. Don't, look, you don't insist on your rights. You don't, you know, get his badge number, you know, all that kind of stuff. He says, just submit for the sake of Christ. Because, because Christ is asking you to. He's asking you to tone it down, take the abuse, don't make a scene. That's what he's asking us to do. And look what he says. He says, whether it's the king as supreme or the president in our case, or to officers being sent by him, and that this would be law enforcement, whether it's you know state or local or whatever, for extending judgments for, for evildoers but condemnation to those who do well, or commendation, excuse me. In other words, the, the point of him sending out officers is to punish the wicked and commend those who do well. Now he says, in this way, that is, enduring the abuse, even from government officials, in this way, the will of God is accomplished. By doing good to silence Ignor the ignorance of stupid men. <laughs> and there he's talking about our accusers, those f people who falsely accuse us, or that police officer who abuses you and charges you with something that you didn't do just because you looked at him the wrong way. You know, or he thought you were being the least bit, I don't know, con you know, um, what's the word? Um, Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Look at verse 16. Live as being free. Now, are we really free? Are we free? We are free. We have freedom in, in Christ. But he says, and not as having a pretext for evil. And that's a, a big problem. A lot of people think that because we are freed from the law of Moses that we now can do anything and we can't do anything. And they use that as a pretext so that they can sin and do things. And, you know, it's, it's the old thing about, you know, um, do it first and ask for forgiveness later kind of a mentality. And there's a lot of Christians who have that. Verse 17, honor all, love the brotherhood. That's agape. It doesn't say for us to love everybody. He says, honor all, love the brotherhood, that is our fellow believers, fear God, honor the king. Employees being submissive to superiors in all reverence, not only to the good and mild, but also to the difficult. And you know, that's, it's the same principle that he talked about with officials, right? You don't get obstinate, you're submissive, you know, if you have an employer and he's, and he is, uh, you know, it's, if you're blessed with a good employer, God bless you. 
that's you know it's a, it's a joy to work for but a lot of people are not and a lot of people their employers just really abuse them and you know he's even in that case we are to take the abuse we are to be submissive we're to be humble and not give anyone an opportunity to accuse us of anything verse 19 for this is commendable if anyone is tolerating hardship, suffering unjustly because of the conscience of God, what that means is submitting to that suffering. You know, this is, this is commendable. God says this is commendable. If anybody endures that kind of abuse and you do it in a humble spirit, this is commendable before God. And why is that? Well, we'll see in a minute. For what recognition is there if you tolerate punishment for doing wrong? But if you tolerate abuse for doing good, this is favored with God. For this is what you were called unto. <laughs> wait, a minute, wait a minute. I thought when I was called to be a Christian, it was so I could fly away to heaven and that, you know, nothing, I, you know, no matter what I did, I would not be punished. And then, uh, you know, I can escape hell and fly away to heaven forever after. I thought that's what I was called to. No, that's not what you were called to. What were you called to? You were called to have a humble spirit, a submissive spirit to all authority, whether it's abusive or not, and to give no one even the slightest opportunity to be able to accuse you of anything, including insubordination. Okay? For this is what you were called unto, that that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. You need to look to Jesus. You know, in, in the previous part, I talked about looking to Abraham to understand what it means to live as a sojourner and a pilgrim or a foreigner in the land while we await the promise of God and the riches of that promise. Here, he's giving us a second example, not just Abraham. Now it's Jesus. Jesus is the example of suffering abuse quietly. Look at his trial. You know, when he was on trial, what happened? They were beating him. They were, you know, doing all these things. It says he didn't open his mouth. He was led. Isaiah 53 says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is dumb. That is, it doesn't say anything. It just stands there patiently and allows them to shear all of its wool off. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't, it doesn't um, make a scene at all. The one who did no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth, who being reviled, was not, uh, was not reviling in return, but was giving it over to the one judging justly. That is, he left it in God's hands because God is going to call every person to account whether it's a government official who abuses people, whether it's a police officer, whether it's, a, whether it's your neighbor, whoever it is, if they treat you unjustly, they're going to give an account to God and he's going to deal out the punishment for that. And that's what Jesus did. He took it humbly and quietly. Um, verse 24, who took, who took up our sins in his own body on the timber is literally what it says. It might say tree in your translation. So that becoming dead to sin, we should live unto justice. Christ did all that for us, and he expects us to follow his example. Who with his wounds you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but you turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Right there in those, those two verses he quoted from. Isaiah 53, twice. With his wounds you were healed and as sheep going astray. That's what we used to be. We were sheep wandering. All we like sheep have gone astray, it says there in that same passage in Isaiah. We have turned everyone to his own way. Christ died for us to redeem us, to become the sons and daughters of God. And he asks us in return to follow Christ's example with regard to abuse, with regard to persecution by everybody else. We are to be just like Jesus was 
when they were beating him and scourging him and he did not, not, no threats came out of his mouth. He could have said, you know what? I'm coming back one day and you better watch out because you're all going to be toast. He didn't, he, he didn't do any trash talking during his whipping or his trial or his crucifixion. He was as humble as a lamb. He's called us to follow in those footsteps. And I hope that really sinks in and that we all learn how to do that in true humility.